keep it uh, quiet for the speakers. And I have a uh, brief announcement. One of our exhibitors, Dan Appleden, brought uh, free books, Our Language Gene, How the Cyber Era is Changing Our Humanity. He's got uh, about 30 uh, free copies of these on the table out there, so please help yourself. Okay, and now our next presenter is very special. Dante Loretta is head of the OSIRIS Asteroid Sample Return Mission, and he's right in the middle of it because that is coming back to Earth, bringing the samples of the asteroid back to Earth just next month. And so we're very lucky to have him here at this conference talking about astrobiology. Dante Loretta. Thank you very much. It's great to be here today. Uh, thank you to Stuart uh, for inviting me. And I'm going to give you a little bit of background on our mission and uh, what comes next when the asteroid samples arrive on Earth. And I'm really excited by the, uh, the venue and the collaboration that I've established with Stuart. Just a little preview. Uh, we're launching the Arizona Astrobiology Center in the fall, and we're allied with the Center for Consciousness Studies. I see a lot of synergy between our two efforts, and we'll be co-located uh, in, a, in a new building, in a new location on the University of Arizona campus. So exciting uh, adventures ahead for us in, in the field of astrobiology and uh, astroconsciousness, a term that Stuart came up with that I've co-opted for this approach. So I'm going to talk a little bit about origin of life, which is a big part of our space mission. I'll give you a little bit of background on OSIRIS-REx, but I won't spend a lot of time on it. Uh, as, as we heard, the samples are coming back on September 24th of this year after, for me, about a 20-year journey for the spacecraft, about seven years uh, since we launched it in 2016. So here you can see uh, yours truly. Uh, this is Kennedy Space Center in September of 2016. This is the OSIRIS-REx spacecraft in final stages of preparation. Behind my, right, uh, behind my shoulder here on the right side of the image is the fairing, that's the nose cone that we encapsulated the spacecraft in as we sent it off on its journey to near-Earth asteroid Bennu and back. And the acronym is um, capturing the primary scientific objectives of our program. And what I'm really interested in and what drove my intellectual curiosity and the motivation for the mission is the origins investigation. When you go back to an asteroid, and you get those rocks and other material from the surface, you're going back in time over four and a half billion years to the era of solar system history before the Earth existed, um, before the planets existed. So you're looking at the very first material that coalesced from the interstellar medium, giant molecular cloud, collapse of a protoplanetary disk, processing inside that disk, and ultimately leading to the accretion of the planets. And what we really want to understand is where did the organic material, where did the water that make up our oceans, where did the air that we breathe, where did all of that come from, and why is Earth a habitable planet, and how did the origin of life occur here? And by extrapolation, how likely is it to have occurred elsewhere in our solar system, elsewhere in our galaxy, and, and as a universal phenomena? We have other investigations related to spectroscopy, asteroid resources, asteroid impact hazard, and we're the regolith explorer. Regolith is the loose blanket of gravel and dust that make up the surface, and that we're all about bringing it home and getting it into our laboratories and doing that exquisite analysis. Uh, here is the target object, asteroid Bennu. You can see its orbit over here on the left, so we have the sun at the center. This is the vernal equinox over here to the right, so in September. You can see this is uh, September 2018 configuration of the planets. Uh, asteroid Bennu's orbit is in blue, and the Earth's orbit is in green, and you can see even looking at the oblique view, uh, it's a near-Earth asteroid. It's an Apollo-type asteroid, which means it actually crosses the orbit of the Earth. It originated out in the main asteroid belt, which exists out here between Mars and Jupiter, and it's kind of tumbled in 
It's a dynamically unstable configuration. It'll last in the inner solar system about 10 million years and either crash into one of the planets, possibly the Earth. It's in fact the most potentially hazardous asteroid that we know of and we are interested in it for that reason as well. It's about 500 meters across, so you can think of it like a small mountain in space. And it's got this really intriguing shape. We, we didn't recognize how critical these spherical or near spherical shapes are. For something that's 500 meters, this is unusual in planetary science. Usually a planet has to uh, achieve hydrostatic equilibrium, has to have a liquid interior, balancing out the force of gravity, and you get a nice sphere. Uh, but because Bennu is close to that, it's, uh, it's actually acting like a fluid. It's a fluid of rubble. Uh, it's, it's just a pile of rocks and boulders. It probably formed 800 million to a billion years ago as the byproduct of a much larger asteroid, maybe 100 kilometers in diameter, that was shattered in a catastrophic disruption. And this is just a bunch of the boulders and gravel that were created in that event and then collapsed back into this small volume and has began its wandering journey through outer space. Chemically, it looks great. It's dominated by water-rich clay minerals, uh, carbonate minerals, which are uh, salts, like you might be familiar with them forming around your faucets, uh, iron oxides, iron sulfides, and abundant organic molecules we see on the surface of the asteroid. So we're very excited uh, to get this material back into our lab. This is uh, the final uh, moment of the mission when we went in to collect the sample. So here's the trajectory of the spacecraft. Uh, we were flying across the sunlit surface. We fired the rocket engines, sending the spacecraft down towards the asteroid. We had to fire the engines another time to match the rotation of the asteroid. And then we made a brief contact with the asteroid surface to collect a sample and get out of there. Let's take a look at uh, this is the view from the spacecraft. So we're looking down at the robotic arm. This is a three meter long robotic arm and this is an air filter which we pushed into the surface of the asteroid. These frames are about one second apart. Inside this blanketing there's bottles of high pressure gas and the collection strategy is very simple. That, that disc is about 30 centimeters across. It's basically an air filter, very much like you would see on a carburetor of a classic car. Uh, and the concept is the same. We push it down into the asteroid surface and then we open up a bottle of gas and kind of like a leaf blower, we just blow all the rocks and gravel into the collector to bring it home. It was a very dynamic event, surprisingly so. The surface responded like a fluid. Even though we kind of knew that from the spherical shape, it wasn't apparent until we hit it. We actually sunk in about 50 centimeters deep into the asteroid, which is way farther than we thought that robotic arm was going to go. But the good news is we collected abundant sample. The mission requirement was 60 grams or about two ounces. We think we have about four times that, uh, 250 grams or, or closer to nine ounces. And then we put the filter inside this capsule. The capsule's about 80 centimeters across. This is on its way back to the Earth right now. It's very, very close. Uh, it'll be here in 35 days and 20 hours. Uh, and. Uh, <laughs> about 20 minutes. It, it, uh, so I invite you all to watch us. It'll be live on NASA TV on September 24th starting at 7 a.m. Pacific, um, 10 a.m. Eastern and we'll get full coverage of the recovery team. I'll be out there. It's coming into the Utah test and training range by parachute and we've been rehearsing like crazy all of the recovery activities. In fact, I'm off again in about a week for the final operational readiness test to, to recover this capsule, get it to the laboratory at Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas, and distribute it to the science team all over the world. And what are we gonna do with it? Why go to an asteroid? Why collect a sample? Why bring it back? And so we wrote the uh, final proposal for this mission back in 2010. NASA selected it in 2011, so we've been on a, a long journey to get to this point. And this is what I wrote, uh, full of bravado, back in 2010. Analyses of these samples provide unprecedented knowledge about pre-solar history through the initial stages of planet formation to the origin of life. And that was good enough for NASA. They said, great, go do it. Here's a billion dollars. Go, go to this asteroid, bring samples back. And pretty much my life was focused on that. Like, okay, this is a huge technological challenge, running this team, managing the budget, keeping the scientists focused, and the asteroid proximity operations were incredibly challenging. 
But now we're looking at the science campaign, the sample analysis phase, and we have a, a massive program. Uh, there's about 54 different hypotheses that we're testing that cover stellar death and what we call pre-solar grain formation, like in supernova outflows, protoplanetary disk processes, and condensation of original materials, accretion of planets, asteroids and evolution, asteroid surveys, uh, we want to understand uh, the origin of the Earth and the origin of Earth as a habitable world. And all of that's pretty easy, actually. <laughs> it's standard cosmochemistry. We've got this pretty well figured out. And then you get to the end of it here, and it's origin of life. And I went, huh, okay, what are we going to do? <laughs> How are we going to tackle origin of life? We can do the simple things like, did it bring carbon? Did it bring oxygen? Did it bring nitrogen? I can already tell you that it did. The question is, how did all of that lead to the origin of life? And so right now, when you look out at the field and astrobiology and origin of life, you know, the dominant scientific view is materialism. Life on Earth originated from inanimate matter via a continuous increase in molecular complexity and functionality. So it's kind of this simple diagram. You start down here, you have an asteroid or a planet, surface of planet Earth. It's not alive. And then you have molecules. Those are a bit abundant in interstellar space. We see them. They're formed in protoplanetary disks and in planetary surfaces and atmospheres. Then you got to get to something that's actually useful, uh, what we would call a biomonomer. This would be uh, a nucleobase, maybe a nucleic acid, uh, an amino acid, lipid, uh, phospholipid molecule. And then you've got to bring all that together, you've got to establish metabolic networks, you've got to establish the genetic code, you've got to compartmentalize those in cell membranes and cell walls, and then you have cells, and then you're alive. This is really hard <laughs> to do, right? We haven't figured out how this could possibly happen, and uh, we take advantage of the machinery of life all the time now in biotechnology, but we can't take an inorganic group of molecules and run the recipe for the prebiotic soup and have a cell form uh, through that process. Now, it could have taken hundreds of millions of years, as we heard about earlier today, but to, I've always felt like there's something missing here. Like, what are, what are we missing in this view, and why haven't we figured it out already? We've got an enormous biotechnology uh, infrastructure. If this was really what was going on, I think we would have solved it already. So I was really looking around for different ideas, different people and how they were approaching this problem to see if there, if there were uh, a way that we could constrain the problem. This diagram just kind of sets the stage from what we know astrophysically. We can constrain when the origin of life would have occurred. So we know when the sun formed, we've got a very good date on that, 4.568 billion years old. That's through radioisotope dating of um, meteorites. We know when the Earth formed by looking at core formation and, and elements that, trans, that uh, partition into the metallic core versus the crust. We know there was a giant impact that formed the moon. This would have, if there was a biosphere, this event would have wiped it out. The entire surface of the Earth would have been magmatic, a magma ocean. Any atmosphere would have been stripped. Any uh, oceans would have been vaporized. And then things had to settle down. You had to form a crust. You had to form the ocean. And then we think these kinds of carbon-rich asteroids and these water-rich asteroids kind of came in late, maybe around four billion years ago. Uh, so you had a half a billion years of, of planetary evolution, a very dynamic, energetic phase where we think life was unlikely. And then somewhere in that 3.8 billion year time frame, the origin of life occurred, and we start to see evidence of it in the geologic record. Some of it's subtle, like carbon, carbon isotopes. Some of it, uh, you start to get into things that look like microfossils. And the reason I'm here today is because one paper that I read um, was by Stuart and about the quantum origin of life. And I remember finding that title, searching through Google Scholar, and I was like, that sounds different than, uh, than a lot of the origin of life investigations. And so I started reading the paper. I found out he was my neighbor on campus, uh, and I called him up, and I said, we need to talk. And then we kind of hit it off and become good friends and have been pursuing these ideas kind of in between running a giant space mission and, and other things. I've been trying to think about this. But I like it for many reasons. Um, one is it's testable, and it's chemical-based. And Stuart has very clear ideas, and it's been great to, to listen to the talks yesterday to see how his ideas have been propagating out into the community. 
And so I'll give my shot at as best as I understand it. Uh, we're dealing with a system that needs to be in quantum superposition. And there is a process called objective reduction which causes that to collapse from that superposition or uncertain state into a definitized state. And when that quantum system collapses, you have this proto-conscious moment. That reduction, the objective reduction, causes the beginning of consciousness. And in the, in the Penrose and Hameroff model, that collapse is not just completely random, that there's something about the fundamental substructure of the universe that controls the probability distribution function, which uh, were called like the Penrose platonic ideals. So now you have something about the fundamental nature of the universe setting up a quantum system and driving it to collapse in a certain manner. And now you have a motivation possibly for the origin of life. Basically, you've got a system in an uncertain state. It becomes a definitive state. That is information. Claude Shannon's definition of information is the resolution of uncertainty. Collapse of a quantum superposition state would be where information can enter the universe. And in the ORCOR model, it's the quantum wave function collapse that causes consciousness. And it maximizes, I think for the next slide, uh, the pleasure principle, right? So you've got, you've got to find a chemical system that can enter quantum superposition that's not alive, but that would be giving you a, a pathway towards a living system. And consciousness is that underlying or motivating force. Basically, the, the molecules are going to want to organize in such a way to get into quantum superposition, and when they collapse, they're going to be collapse driven by the Penrose uh, platonic ideals. And this is a figure right out of Stewart's paper here talking about one type of molecular arrangement that's a good candidate for this are these polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. They can enter into quantum superposition states. The benzene ring, the six-sided carbon ring, seems to be really essential to this process. Uh, what's happening here is you have uh, six carbon atoms, um, their pi electrons go into uh, a ring structure. So instead of each electron being associated with a carbon atom, they go into a, a set of rings, and that ring can put the electrons into quantum superposition. And so the, question, the first question is, okay, do these hydrocarbon rings exhibit this kind of quantum behavior? Can we explore that? And if they do, are they available from these asteroids? Were these the kinds of compounds that were available on the surface of the early Earth? If we take a look at uh, our understanding of organic molecular cosmochemistry, we actually see this looks pretty promising here, right? So you start out in the, say, the center of a star, nucleosynthesis is occurring, you've got a plasma state, there's no molecules whatsoever, everything is, all the electrons are stripped and nuclear reactions are taking place. But then these uh, newly formed atoms get pushed out into the interstellar medium and things get really cold, you'll form ices. Those ices can be irradiated. Your ices aren't just water, but methane with carbon, ammonia with nitrogen. Those get hit with ultraviolet photons and you start to do photochemistry and you can start to make these aromatic rings. And then once you get into the protoplanetary disk where the interstellar medium collapses, temperatures heat up, you start to catalyze reactions, for example, on metal surfaces, and we start to produce really large polycyclic aromatic structures, and then ultimately you get into the comets or the asteroids where some geology can kick in, and you can have even more organic molecular evolution, and then this is what gets delivered to the surface of your planet. So we have lots of good opportunities there. I'm going to deviate a little bit here because I think I've, uh, I've got some interesting work going on that supports uh, Stuart's ideas here about quantum systems underlying the origin of life. And this is really some work coming out of the group at Stanford. Uh, Adam Brown and, and Susskind have introduced this idea of a second law of, quant of complexity. And this is similar to the second law of thermodynamics. And what they're stating, possibly, is that in a quantum state, the complexity tends to increase over time, very much like entropy in a classical system. And they demonstrate it. It's, it's being used in quantum computing to describe complexity in quantum circuits. And complexity has a very specific definition. It's how many operations do you need to get to your output. Uh, the more complex an algorithm, the more steps you need, the more processing that's required. They also show it in classical geodesics and what they're interested in is the growth of space-time beyond black hole horizons. And that sounds amazing, 
But I would encourage you to read the 2018 paper, which is this, called The Second Law of Complexity, where they propose that they might be looking at a fundamental law of nature similar to the second law of thermodynamics. And I got excited about this because I've been looking for this motivating force. And we always run into the second law of thermodynamics and ent entropy and the heat death of the universe as something that's a barrier to the, to the evolution. But if you have complexity as a resource that can keep growing, this might explain how life overcomes the second law of thermodynamics. And what I found here was they describe how, what a system would do if it's evolving according to the second law. First of all, it'll reach a maximum value of complexity. It'll approach that linearly. So you start out here at zero complexity, and then you've got some maximum value that's set by the nature of the quantum circuit, the number of qubits, the depth of the circuit, and the logic gates that are present there. And then the system will just plateau out, and there'll be no change in complexity for an exponentially long time. You can have quantum recurrences where, just through statistical fluctuation, the complexity drops down, and then the linear growth uh, repeats. What's interesting is this looks a lot like biological evolution. For example, the prokaryotic cell originated. There was so far you could take that simple biological design, and life sat there for a billion years with just the prokaryotic cell. And then you, have, you can have external perturbations, which will lead to exponential growth over a scrambling time. And then you can reset your quantum circuit, and a new maximum value of complexity can be established. For example, the eukaryotic cell, which also persisted in that life and that form for a billion years or so. And then multicellularity, and then neural systems, and now computer systems. So we're seeing that the characteristics of the second law of complexity are reflected in the growth of biological complexity over geologic time. So what that implies is that in order to de demonstrate that kind of behavior, that biology might have quantum information processing at its core. And there's certain structures within biomolecules that are potential sites. I talked about the benzene rings and how the pi uh, clouds can uh, enter a superposition state. I like the indole rings, for example, in the um, amino acid tryptophan. And if we take those structures, nucleic acids and the aromatic amino acids are two key targets. And um, I think Stuart, and we've heard a lot about the uh, aromatic amino acids, we're very interested in those and we're going to explore them. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, nucleic acids because the leading theory in origin of life research is the RNA world hypothesis. This is, that says that uh, RNA was the first biomolecule, that they may have been the first things to replicate and evolve. We know RNA is involved in transferring information in our cells. You have messenger RNA. It plays incredibly important roles in protein translation uh, through the ribosome, which has uh, got its core, a couple different RNA molecules. It also brings the amino acids to the ribosome as transfer RNA. So it's central to the, the um, mechanisms of biology. It can also catalyze reactions kind of like enzymes do, not as efficiently, but similarly. So this is why we like it for origin of life. It can have information. It can also do uh, enzymatic reactions. And it looks like a cousin to DNA. And with help in the lab, DNA, uh, RNA can replicate, it can evolve, it can interact with its environment. So I thought, well, OK, we have a system. The biological history of life on Earth is evolving according to the proposed law of second, uh, second law of complexity, implying that there might be quantum information processing at the core of biology. And then I came across this paper by this group in Taiwan, which I really think we need to investigate to see if this is legitimate or not. I'm not, I'm not qualified enough, but they show in this paper that the proton state between two base pairs in RNA can enter into a superposition. You have the acceptor uh, nucleobase and the donor nucleobase. And you have, for example, in the um, CG base pair, you have three protons. And they, when the base pair is bound like this, the proton is in a superposition between the acceptor and the donor, and you have three of those. In this paper, they claim this is what's called a Toffoli quantum logic gate which means it looks at the first two qubits and then swaps the third qubit based on the state. And then they say the same thing. These are C-naught gates in the AU and GU bonding of uh, nucleic acid base pairs. So this is really exciting if it's true. 
I would say that would lead to a new idea called quantum emergence hypothesis. Basically, what we're looking for, if Stuart's right, and we're looking at quantum consciousness, and we're looking for collapse of the wave function to search for origin of life, we need to prioritize prebiotic pathways that can generate qubits. We need to look for biochemical systems that can operate as quantum gates and represent unitary operators so that we can manipulate prebiotic constituents to create a quantum information processing system. So I think we are circling around the same problem, looking for the origins of life and the origins of consciousness. I think they're intimately related, maybe even the same thing, two sides of the same coin. Uh, we're looking for quantum coherent superposition among organic biomolecules. In the RNA world molecule, quantum superposition may be established by these proton state qubits. One thing that RNA does is it does these hairpin turns and then folds back on itself. So if you think about this, this would be three qubits, this would be uh, two qubits. You've got about a 14 qubit logic system right here, and then it can pull back and, and hold the state of that system. What would RNA want to measure? It's going to want to measure its chemical environment. Is it, what's the pH? How many other nucleobases are around? Two minutes, thank you. So uh, we're looking for, to, to explore whether this is a, a good idea or not. I'm not saying this is right, I'm saying it's exciting. It links up with the ORC OR by establishing a quantum superposition chemical system. It provides a molecule that can undergo evolution and of course is central to modern biology here. So by looking at RNA as a potential quantum circuit, we can explore the interplay between these molecular structures and quantum states gate operations to gain insight into the origin of life and the emergence of complexity. So I think we need to study this. I would also say if this is right, we should be building quantum computers based on biomolecules, nucleic acids, and as we heard, uh, the aromatic amino acid bearing proteins. So I'll leave you with that, uh, and I think we have time maybe for a couple questions. For or time for a couple questions real quick. So I'm an applied mathematician who studies the relationship between uh, dissipative shocks and dispersive shocks. And of course, dissipative uh, shocks and dissipation uh, expresses the second law of thermodynamics. So I immediately wonder, could this law of complexity be related to dispersion and soliton formation? I think we would have to talk about that offline. I don't know that I can answer that here. I think if, if they're right, and I, and I would encourage us as a community to go and investigate it, because they're, they're even speculative in their paper and they're very careful about saying that, this should be true in any kind of system where you can have a complexity growth. Any, it's a, they use this term uncomplexity as a resource just like entropy is a resource, right? If you can decrease your entropy, you've got more information, you're in a, in a lower probability state, and then the complexity can still continue to grow even in those kinds of conditions. So maybe, if it's a universal law, it should, be, it should show up in a lot of different environments. The fact that I'm reading papers about space-time on black hole horizons just tells you how far this, these kinds of ideas can expand. <laughs> Uh, so uh, this is, this is uh, I'm looking for your opinion and comment on this. So a law of complexity, I think, makes sense. And as you're applying it to biological systems, but if you look at evolution, it's adaptation. So there are pressures. And you know, our current belief is that there is enough randomness that the one that, is, that got it right wins. But it still leaves a question. Is, it, is there a directionality? Right. Is, and that, so I was just wondering what you thought, think of that. And I think, I think there is in complexity, right? Like measuring biological complexity is not a straightforward thing. There's lots of papers about it. There's lots of ways to approach it. But if you just look at life on Earth, there was the prokaryotic cell, right? A very basic, the most basic life form, maybe viruses even simpler, the prokaryotic form. And that persisted for hundreds of millions of years until the eukaryotic cell showed up through endosymbiosis or whatever, and then all of a sudden you had a higher maximum complexity available to the system, and it could grow to a much more complex state. And the same thing with the transition to multicellularity. So the way to look at it is there's that maximum complexity. 
which you could trace back, if the theory's right, to the number of qubits in the system, and that you're, when you add a qubit, all of a sudden you get an exponential growth in the amount of complexity available to the system, and then with your, your evolution takes place to maximize that complexity. It's using it as a resource, basically. Okay, we gotta keep going. Thank Guys, you. next. <laughs> you wanna hold the mic or have